Following the truce of July 1921 that saw the fighting between the Irish Republican Army, IRA, and the British Army end, the president of Sinn Féin and the Doyle, Eamon de Valera, travelled to London to meet with the UK Prime Minister, Lloyd George. This meeting between the two laid the foundations for the treaty negotiations that would change the modern course of Ireland. It also laid down the main contention between the two, the question on Ireland's status. Lloyd George insisted that the British would not go further than offering Ireland dominion status, such as Canada and Australia, where they would be, for all intents and purposes, an independent state, with their own government, army and foreign relations. But the British monarch would remain the head of state. De Valera refused, instead insisting on a policy he called external association, that even today many historians are unsure what exactly it meant. Following this meeting, De Valera returned home to Dublin, but communication remained open as neither side wanted to return to war, until finally on the 11th of October 1921, Lloyd George organised the start of the conference that would see the negotiation of one of the most important treaties in modern Irish history. The British aims can be summed up into three parts. First, ensuring that Ireland remained part of the British Empire. The term British Commonwealth isn't officially used until after this treaty. By having Ireland become a dominion state such as Canada or Australia. Second, to guarantee British security. It was feared that an independent Ireland may choose to ally with an enemy of Britain. To ensure the security, Britain wanted the control of three treaty ports in Ireland. Further, they felt the oath of allegiance to the British monarchy would help ensure the security. Third and finally, the British negotiating team wished to keep Northern Ireland. This was actually conservative input due to them being in a coalition government with Lloyd George Liberals at the time. It must be noted here, however, that the British government were willing to grant Ireland the fullest amount of independence that could be achieved within these aims. The Irish aims were mainly twofold. The first aim was achieving de Valera's external association, thus allowing them republic status as an independent state. This, however, was never openly mentioned, requested or discussed, as it would have led to the breakdown of the treaty talks and a return to war. The second aim of the Irish was the reunification of Northern Ireland's six counties into the rest of Southern Ireland's 26, leading to a united Ireland. It is important to note here as well that the Irish had no real plan on how to get Britain to agree to their republic status or how to convince the Ulster Unionists to agree to a united Ireland. The British negotiating team was made up of a mix of Conservatives and Liberals and including many greatly experienced team members, some of whom had attended the Paris Peace Conference two years beforehand in 1919. The British team was led by Liberal Prime Minister Lloyd George, who had the nickname of the Welsh Wizard due to his political cunning and his reputation as a brilliant negotiator. The other members of the British team were Winston Churchill, who was at this time the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Birkenhead, a prominent and well-respected leader for the Unionist wing of the Conservative Party and Lord Chancellor, Austin Chamberlain, the leader of the House of Commons and the half-brother of future Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, Sir Lamming Worthington Evans, the Secretary of State for War, Sir Gordon Hubert, the Attorney General, and Sir Hammer Greenwood, the Chief Secretary for Ireland. The Irish delegation lacked the experience in negotiating that the British team had, and so went into these negotiations with that substantial disadvantage. The Irish team was also a mix of moderate to extreme Republicans, which caused some tensions between the Irish delegation members on certain issues. The team was led by Arthur Griffith, the original founder of the first Sinn Féin party in 1905, and seen by many as a moderate Republican. The other members of the Irish delegation included Robert Barton, the Secretary of State for Economic Affairs and a staunch Republican, Eamon Dugan, the TD or Chakta Dalla, which is a member of the lower house of the Doyle Aaron, 
for Larry Meath, George Gavin Duffy, TD for Dublin County, and Michael Collins, the Secretary of State for Finance. Collins, however, was reluctant to attend the negotiations, saying, To me, the task is a loathsome one. I go in the spirit of the soldier who acts against his best judgment at the order of his superior. Many have questioned De Valera's decision not to attend the talks or lead the Irish team. His reasoning was that by staying in Ireland, he would be able to calm the extremism and that as head of state, it wouldn't be appropriate for him to attend the talks. His critics, however, claimed that De Valera knew that independence would not be the result of the treaty negotiations and so set the Irish team up as scapegoats, especially Michael Collins, who he had a mild rivalry with. During the course of the treaty negotiations, three main sticking points arose that became the main topical issues of the negotiations. The first of these points, but the one solved relatively quickly, was the question of defence. As previously mentioned, the security of the UK was a paramount aim for the British negotiating team. While staunch Republicans argued that acceding to the British request for so-called treaty ports would sacrifice Irish sovereignty, it was nonetheless agreed to that the UK would control the three treaty ports of Queenstown, Brehaven and Loch Swilly. It was also agreed here the Irish would be allowed to have their own standing armed forces and that the Royal Navy would be responsible for the Irish naval protection. The other two points proved to be more difficult to solve. The second issue was on the question of Irish unity. One of the core aims of the Irish delegation was the reunification of Ireland, which had been divided into the 6 county Northern Ireland and the 26 county Southern Ireland by the 1920 Government of Ireland Act. By the time of the Anglo-Irish negotiations, Northern Ireland had become an established state within the United Kingdom, having its own devolved parliament and with James Craig as its first leader. Craig had been offered a place at the negotiating table by Lord George, but had refused to attend. Craig's decision was supported by the Conservative Party and so the interests of Northern Ireland in the negotiations were represented for by Lord Birkenhead. As a result of this conservative input, as previously mentioned, one of the main aims of the British was allowing Northern Ireland to remain a part of the UK proper. Lord George, on the other hand, was more flexible on the issue. As a Liberal, he had supported Home Rule for Ireland since the first Home Rule Bill in 1886. It was his suggestion of a border commission, which would eventually give large portions of Northern Ireland making it economically unviable to the South. That would see Griffith sign an agreement on the issue. Griffith, however, did not consult the rest of the Irish delegation on his agreement to the Border Commission. The third and hardest to solve issue proved to be the status of Ireland. On paper, this seemed to be a trivial issue. However, in reality, it was one of the more important issues to both sides. The main aim of the Irish delegation was gaining republic status, meaning that they would be an entirely independent state from Britain. The British on the other hand wanted Ireland to be a dominion, where for all intents and purposes they would be an independent state, but still remain a part of the British Empire. On the 24th of October, Griffith reintroduced de Valera's proposal for external association, which would grant Ireland Republic status. Lloyd George rejected this and once more reiterated what he had said to De Valera, that the furthest the UK would go was Dominion status. By early November 1921, many of these issues had been left unsolved and the two delegations deadlocked. Between the 14th of November and the 2nd of December, the Irish delegation returned home to Dublin to consult with De Valera, where he restated and insisted upon external association and Irish unity. Upon resumption of the negotiations on the 2nd of December, Lloyd George and the British delegation tactically split the Irish delegation into subcommittees. In these subcommittees, the more Republican and extreme members of the delegations could argue over meaningless issues. 
while Lloyd George and the rest of the senior British delegation could negotiate with the more moderate members of the Irish delegation, such as Griffith and Collins. Finally, on the 5th of December 1921, at 10 past 2 in the morning, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed. Lloyd George managed this with a mixture of threat and his brilliance as a negotiator. He refused to allow the Irish delegation to consult with Dublin to, due to their status as plenipotentiaries and threatened that if this treaty was not signed, then Ireland and the UK would return to a state of war. While signing the treaty, two quotes are worth noting here. The first from Arthur Griffith, who said, This is no more the final treaty than we are the final generation on the face of the earth. And the second quote from Michael Collins, who said, Tonight I have signed my death warrant. The final treaty terms were, 1. Ireland should be known as the Irish Free State. 2. Ireland shall be granted dominion status and will remain a member of the British Commonwealth of Nations. 3. The Irish Free State will have its own army, parliament and government. 4. Members of the Irish Parliament shall swear an oath of allegiance first to the Irish Free State and then to the British Monarch. 5. A Governor General shall be appointed to represent the interests of the Crown in Ireland. 6. Britain will retain control of the three treaty ports and will have access to them during wartime. 7. Northern Ireland will be able to opt out of joining the Irish Free State. 8. A boundary commission will be set up to review the Irish border. The treaty split Ireland into two camps. Pro-treaty, led by moderates like Griffith and Collins, with Collins supporting the treaty by saying, this treaty gives Ireland the freedom to achieve freedom. An anti-treaty, led by Republicans like De Valera and Bruja. Erskine Childers, another anti-treaty TD, stated that the treaty places Ireland definitely and irrevocably under the British authority and under the British crown. Even before the debates in the Doyle concluded both the Irish press and members of the Catholic clergy in Ireland supported the treaty. This combined with the war weariness of the Irish public led to the majority of the public supporting the treaty. The Anglo-Irish Treaty would be the main cause of the Irish Civil War, which would soon follow. The treaty provoked strong opposition from Unionists in Northern Ireland. They viewed it as the start of the end of the Union. In protest of the treaty, MPs walked out of the House of Commons. In Britain, the House of Commons voted overwhelmingly for the treaty in a vote of 473 for to 47 against. The international community also viewed the treaty favourably and restored the UK standing internationally after atrocities committed by the Crown forces in Ireland during the War of Independence. The Anglo-Irish Treaty is one of the most important turning points in modern Irish history. While many point to the War of Independence as the true start of Irish independence, it was this treaty that allowed Ireland, if not complete independence, then partial independence and the opportunity to work towards securing their own free republic. The treaty was also the main cause of the Irish Civil War, which resulted in one year of bloody fighting between pro-treaty and anti-treaty forces, and the death of Michael Collins. If you enjoyed this video, then please do hit that like button and share it with friends. If you want to see more content from me, then please do consider subscribing. If there's a topic you want to see me cover, then let me know down in the comment section below. You can also join the History of Wolves Discord channel. It will be in the comment section as well as the description. I'll see you in the next video. This has been Adam from History of Wolves.